The last aspect would be the orientation of the spin states. This is going to be important in order to understand how the magnetization that comes up from a molecule will be exploited in NMR spectroscopy. For a quantum number of half, you're going to have MI states of plus minus half. Positive gamma magnetic ratios, you have two states, alpha and beta. So what would be the orientation of these two states with respect to the main magnetic field? So you have the right-handed coordinates coordinate system. And remember, I square and half plus minus half is going to give you h cross square into i into i plus 1 and the function back. It is independent of the mi quantum number. It is only dependent on the i quantum number. So in the case of spin half systems, you are going to get h cross square half into half plus 1. That is going to be equal to h cross square times 3 by 4. And iz on the same state is going to give you h cross by 2 with a plus minus depending upon the state you are interrogating because that is sensitive to mi. Therefore, you have a vector for one state. Let us take alpha state whose magnitude is going to be square root. Basically, this is going to be the i vector. It is going to be the square root of what you ended up getting here. Once again, for the sake of simplicity, let us put h cross to 1. You are going to get square root of 3 by 2. The z projection of this is going to be plus half. On the other hand, and remember, we have applied b naught along z. And the beta state is going to have a projection of minus half and the length of the vector remains square root of 3 by 2. So what will be the angle that is subtended by these states with respect to the main magnetic field is that you got to get what is cos of theta that is going to be half divided by square root of 3 by 2 which will be 1 by square root of 3. If you calculate this you will get something like 54.7 degrees. If you have a regular magnet that would end up aligning itself parallel to the main magnetic field. In this case, you have orientations that are like parallel and like anti-parallel. Of course, the anti-parallel orientation of the magnet is going to be higher in energy. This is lower in energy due to minus mu dot p you are able to understand the quantum magnets are not able to entirely align parallel or anti-parallel to the mag magnetic field. But many times people end up saying this is the parallel state, the stable parallel state and this is the anti-parallel state. What will be the projection along the x and y axis? I would like to remind you of the fact that L square comma Lz is 0, Lx comma Ly is going to be i h cross l z meaning that there is an uncertainty associated with the measurement of x and z. This could end up spanning a cone in either of this axis. So with the knowledge that we have gained so far, let us reflect upon some of the examples that we saw earlier. Let us take the example of water. You have only one spin that is present. When you apply B naught, you are going to have an energy difference that is going to be present you will be able to find the Larmor precession frequency of water. On the other hand, when you ended up going for methanol, what ends up happening is that when you have a given B naught, the energy difference between the hydroxyl proton and that of the methyl proton would be subtly different. This comes up because of the fact that the proton that you are looking at has an electron cloud that is significantly influenced by the electronegative atom. On the other hand, the methyl protons experience an electron cloud that is very different from this. That will end up coming as subtle differences in these energy levels. Which is exactly why when you get the NMR spectrum, you have two resonances that end up coming for methanol. And in the example of ethanol, you are going to have three such energy differences that end up coming. So therefore, what ends up happening is that when you apply this B0 field, the subtle energy differences end up influ influencing the spectrum.
therefore you get three resonances for ethanol. On the other hand, we can ask why do we end up getting multiplicity? For instance, this is going to be a quartet or this is going to be a triplet. Why does this end up happening? So let's look at the methylene proton. It has a neighbor which is a methyl proton. And there are three of such methyl protons. What ends up happening? You could have all the three protons that are in the alpha state or all the three protons that could be in the beta state. It could also be that you have combinations of them which is alpha alpha beta, alpha beta alpha, beta alpha alpha. Similarly, you could have alpha beta beta, beta alpha beta and beta beta alpha. And when you count these together, you get something of the sort a 1, 3, 3, 1. This ends up influencing the multiplicity and also the intensity of the multiplets that end up coming. On the other hand, when you are looking at the methyl proton that gets perturbed by the methylene proton, you have two protons. Therefore, you can have alpha alpha or beta beta. And then you could have an alpha beta and beta alpha. So this will end up being 1 is to 2 is to 1. Therefore, you end up getting a triplet that is being present in that given ratio. In order to summarize the story with the multiplicity, let's try to generalize how this works out. So when you have a single lone proton, it ends up coming as a singlet. So an example in this case could be a methyl proton, for instance, in neopentane. On the other hand, when you have a situation where the proton that you are observing has another neighbor, let's call it HA, HB, and you are observing HA, you are going to end up getting a 1 is to 1 doublet. If the proton that you are observing ends up having two scalarly coupled protons, then you are going to end up getting a 1, 2, 1. 2 comes up as in the Pascal's triangle with the sum of these two entities. If you are going to be looking at a proton that couples with three other protons, then you are going to end up having the similar case where these two sums up to give you 3 and again these two sum up to give you 3. As you build this up further, you are going to have 1, 4, 6, 4, 1 and 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1 and so on. So this is called the Pascal's triangle which could be useful in order for you to predict what will be the multiplicity accompanied when you have multiple protons that couple. For the triplet, you're going to have 1 is to 2 is to 1 ratio, where the splitting will be equal on either side. And for a quartet, you're going to have 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, with once again splitting being equal. This works out in such a way because you are talking about a spin quantum number of half coupling with the spin of interest that you are looking at. So the general formula goes as 2ni plus 1 will be the multiplicity, meaning if you have a spin that is having n number of neighbors with spin quantum number of i, then you end up getting a 2ni plus 1 multiplicity. Let's take for an instance and apply it for three protons that are present, all of which are spin half. So you're going to have 2 times 3 times half plus 1, which will be 4, which is what you ended up getting as quartet. So similarly, if you want to look at two spins that are coupled, both of which are spin half, you're going to end up getting a triplet, which is what you saw here. On the other hand, let's say you have a proton that couples the deuterium. Remember, deuterium is a spin 1 nuclei. So at that point, you have 2 times n is 1 here because you have single deuterium times 1 plus 1. That is going to be equal to 2 plus 1 equal to 3. In this case, also it will be a triplet. But remember, the triplet will be a 1 is to 1 is to 1 triplet, not a 1 is to 2 is to 1 triplet. This comes up because for the proton that is couples the deuterium, it can either be in the 1 state, 0 state or minus 1 state. 
each of which are equally populated at equilibrium. So therefore, one is able to understand from the multiplicity, although both are triplets, one can actually say whether it's coupled to a proton or a deuterium. And similarly, with the kind of pattern that you end up saying 1 is to 2 is to 1 versus 1 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, you would be able to adjudge whether you're looking at a methane proton or a methylene proton or for that matter, methyl proton as well. I hope this introductory lecture has helped you understand how NMR is applied in order to get atomistic information and how the nuclear spin results in a magnetic moment and the nuclear spin state end up splitting in presence of a main magnetic field with which one can probe the molecular structure using NMR spectroscopy. In further lectures, we will be looking at how the magnetization that ends up coming from the spins is manipulated to get the information that we require. Thank you.